You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you further. You step forward little by little, not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Everyone and welcome to the Deeper Waters podcast. I am Nick Peters, your host, seeking to bring you the very best in Christian scholarship and apologetics. And today is no exception. We have another marriage show today. Try to get a lot of these for February, couldn't get them in, but somehow we got them in afterwards. And today we're talking about what it would mean to cherish one another, which is something important in marriage. And I can remind everyone that uh, sometimes you might say, Nick, why do you do all these shows on marriage? This is an apologetics podcast. Because marriage is an apologetics issue. We are in a state in our country right now where people are trying to redefine marriage and such, and one of the best ways we can win the battle on marriage is to start living it better ourselves and treating it like the sacred institution it is. And today, to do that, I've got a husband-wife team who've got a book together, Cherishing Us, which is 365 Ways to Improve Your Marriage, one for every day of the year. Don't think they have anything for leap years, but I'm sure they could think of reason number 366. And that's uh, Debbie and Tom Walter here to join us today. So, um, Debbie and and Tom... uh, Thanks for joining us on Deeper Waters podcast. Thanks, Nick. It's great to be with you. Now, if my audience doesn't know much about who you are, tell us a bit about how you all got to be doing what you're doing. Oh, wow. Well, um, we've been married now for 39 years to mm-hmm. celebrate our 39th anniversary. Mm-hmm. And when we first got married, uh, marriage was something very uh, important in my in my heart and in Debbie's. Mm-hmm. Uh, my parents got divorced on my 18th birthday, and um, when we got married, I just had a commitment that we were going to try and do it right, do it God's way. Mm-hmm. So we've been involved in marriage ministry most of our married life. Mm-hmm. You know, when sometimes my wife and I drive to another city here for an appointment and such, and on the way back I can see a billboard advertising a divorce attorney's business. And I know that sometimes that could be a sad necessity, but it just always still gets me very sad. And I just take her hand immediately and just always assure her, not us. Right. That's good. Right. Well, that was a, that was one of the things that we made, the commitment. We'd never bring up the D word, mm-hmm. threaten that in any way. And unfortunately, um, the divorce in, in the Christian church is something that's on the rise. And mm. so that's why we see it such an important part uh, of our ministry is leading people to Christ, but the, having a marriage that honors him and reflects what he intended marriage to be. Mm-hmm. I realize sometimes, in some cases, like in case of abuse and such, divorce could sometimes be a sad necessity but right. even then, it's still sad because a couple that agreed to live in fidelity and faithfulness to one another somewhere along the way didn't. Exactly. And it, just because we made that commitment doesn't mean that it's been an easy ride for us. We've right. gone through some right. really difficult times mm-hmm. in our marriage. We, we jokingly say that we've been married 39 years, 35 happy, mm-hmm. because there were four years that we... Uh, regret that they happened, but we're grateful that they did because of what God showed us through the process. Mm-hmm. But I, we were, I was so grateful that even in the midst of that, that I knew that there would never be a divorce, mm-hmm. that we, we would both be committed to, to make it through it. And at least four times, it took an entire year to get through that trouble. Mm-hmm. But God was faithful, and on the other side of it, it was sweeter than what it was before we'd gone through it. And did you have to do anything like go and get some marriage counseling at that point or anything like that? 
Oh, we had our pastors on speed dial. Yeah. <laughs> We even live in the neighborhood with a couple of them, so we would uh, occasionally knock on their door at midnight. So, wow, the big help sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now you've got this book, "Cherishing Us Together," three hundred sixty-five. Your thoughts, such and the really interesting thing about this is someone if it's someone saying. I don't have enough time to really read a book with my spouse and such. That definitely doesn't apply in this case, does it? Not at all. Um, this book is is not a, the kind of book that you would sit down and read cover to cover. It's, right. it's broken up into seasons, mm-hmm. uh, the seasons of a vineyard, because of the romantic vineyard being our website. And um, it's broken up into spring, summer, winter, fall. And it's really 365 healthy marriage tips or mm-hmm. ideas for each day. So more like a devotional, but it's just a very short one sentence, two sentence yep. uh, you know, tip in each one. So it could be picked up. You could read one sentence, just think and ponder on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, Also at the end of each chapter, we have um, ideas or each, each month there's ideas for date nights um, to mm-hmm. be creative and then questions to spark conversations beyond how are you today? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, you also talk about the romantic vineyard being your site just now. Um, I'm thinking about imagery comes from a song of songs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Actually, um, the way the whole title came about, we had just taken a trip um, to France, and we had taken a walk through um, a vineyard every morning, and it was just beautiful. So when we got home, we had the idea to start this blog mostly for a resource for the couples that we were counseling through our church. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. because we were always repeating ourselves, you know, look at this, look at this. And so we finally decided just to put it all in one place and we could send them there. Well, it ended up becoming much bigger than we ever expected. Mm -hmm. So we called it the Romantic Vineyard because we wanted to cultivate what what we thought was romance at the time. But I think Gary Thomas with his book, Cherish, has shown us that really the word that we were were reaching for was the word cherish, because that's the heart. It's not just romance, like a romantic novel or a romantic chick flick. It's not just the feeling of that, but it's the whole aspect of, of cherishing your spouse and doing the things that show your affection for them and show your appreciation for them in creative ways that are going to mean something to them. Mm-hmm. And, um, so that's how um, we came up with the idea for the vineyard, you know, just on a fluke. But then after we named it that, started doing some study about how a vineyard works and thinking about abiding in the vine that Christ taught. Um, The the metaphors for vineyard and marriage and also our Christian walk are just endless Mm -hmm. and very helpful. I I tend to think in word pictures. So I love having a metaphor or analogy that I can apply to something that God's teaching me. And it it, um, stays with me easier that way. Yeah, I, I like that you talked about Gary Thomas's book, Cherish. I, I read that one a few months or so ago, and, and I did think it was excellent. But you, yes. we we do need to talk some about that, I think, because when many of us hear the word cherish, it seems to be like a word that that a guy would use to describe his wife or his girlfriend. And we often think romance, I think, is something more the women want. But really, both both people want romance, don't they? Absolutely. I think um, a guy, I mean, one of the things that, that's a challenge for, was a challenge for me in the beginning was one of the, the things that Gary Thomas asked people to do in his book or in the study series was to explain what cherishing looked like for you. Mm-hmm. Look like for Debbie to cherish me, mm-hmm. in my opinion. And yeah. that, I had to think about that for a little bit because mm-hmm. as, as, great of a job as she does in that it's not something that as a guy I'm used to thinking about how would I want somebody to cherish me um, but I think what it, what it really means is just as Gary I think describes love is more the the muscle it's the it's the commitment it's the sacrifice it's the you know what we do with in the covenant part of marriage and cherish mm-hmm. is more the the emotion behind it more the thought the heart, um, not just the as the muscle part, but as as really the 
being thoughtful and thinking through what what can I do to bless me today? What can I do to make her life easier? What can I do um, to let her know how how loved she is and how cherished she is? So, well, when I think about that, I'm thinking about uh, I'm I'm been reading a book on Daniel Eight by Danny Aiken on marriage now, and I won't say what the title is yet because it gives it away. But he said. Yeah, now, ladies, here it is. For a guy, romance is a three-letter word. Sex. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Part of it. But, you know, we've, we've um, done many different groups that we've had in our house and hosted couples and mm-hmm. gone through that. And, and as guys think about that, um, the sex part being something that we, we look at, it really is, mm-hmm. uh, it takes a lot more than just, Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Yeah. It, it is more caring for one another. So it's not just a physical act, but it becomes a deep spiritual and emotional act as well. Mm. You know, I, I think if many of us men are honest, we also don't just want a physical act. We want something exciting. I did something interesting. I have a, my own men's group on Facebook for Christian men who are married, engaged, dating, or hoping to date and marry. It's called As Christ Loved the Church for All Christian Men Interested in It's Guys Only, exclusive. And mm-hmm. I asked this question there and in the hot, holy, and humorous community of Jay Parker. Right, and right. And I asked question, okay, guys, here's the question. I wanted only men to answer, although in the hot, holy, and humorous, sometimes women answered on behalf of their husbands. I said, here's the question. You can have a woman who has an awesome body but she has little or no passion for you whatsoever. Or you can have a woman who's just a plain Jane or something like that sorts, but she's got incredible passion. Which one do you choose? Not a single person I saw voted for body. Not a single one. No, hands down. Yeah. Because bodies change. I mean, I don't know about mm. everybody else, but mine has, Debbie's mm. has. Yeah. Um, you know, and if, if we're committed to a body or a certain look, what happens when mm-hmm. you get older? Or what happens yeah. when something happens to change you physically? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's deeper than that. Yeah. So you're right. Yeah. And there comes, I think, also uh, uh, on um, the same note there that women tend to compare themselves with what is out there in the culture. Yeah. So we can have a tendency to think that we fall short and that when our husbands compliment us or they encourage us or they say things, we can automatically say, well, he just wants sex. Mm -hmm. He's just wanting to coax me into the bedroom and not believe what he's saying to us as a compliment. And so I have taken it on myself to believe him when he says what he says and to Mm -hmm. thank him. And I don't anymore argue with him, like say, well, yeah, but what about this? What about that? Which I've heard so many wives do that. And, you know, we think that it's being um, helpful to our husbands, but it's not because it's basically telling them you have poor taste in women (laughs) and because you're stuck with me. And, you know, that's not a message that we want to even entertain at all in our marriage. We want to trust each other. And even down to the fact that when my husband compliments me, I want to believe that what he's saying, he really believes it. As Gary says in his book, Cherish, she is my Eve. There is no other. And, you know, if if she doesn't accept my my love and my care for her, I'm I'm not going to look somewhere else. She's the only one on earth for me. Yeah. yeah. Tom, I I think a lot of of women might be surprised at this, but when— but Debbie talked about having this kind of struggle in the past and such just now. When we compliment our wives and they deny it or argue against it or anything like that, it really hurts us, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things that, I mean, there, like I said, there's there's nobody else that I'm going to give that compliment to. Mm-hmm. She needs to understand that even when she looks in the mirror, what she sees is not the same thing that I see. Yeah. Debbie, my wife and I met with a friend of hers today who Mm -hmm. said that uh, when women go out and try and beautify themselves and things of that sort and such, they're really doing it for other women instead. They're they're wanting to be seen in a glorified way by other women. Would you agree with that? I think there's definitely a temptation for that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
I would not say that that's a healthy way to think because mm-hmm. number, number one, comparing ourselves with anyone else is going to do one of two things. It's going to make us feel worse about ourselves, which is going to be mm-hmm. a, a form of pride because, you know, when you're, when you you're, have really, really low self-esteem, you know, you're, you're craving attention from other people yeah. and you're not getting it. So it's still a self-focus or I can compare myself with someone else and think I look much better than that person does. So all you're doing is feeding your pride. Yep. So um, that's a that's one of those thoughts we need to take captive and realize that we're doing that for our husbands yep. because we want we want them to say wow. That's kind of my goal with Tom. I like to make him say wow. And she yeah. does that. She does a <laughs> job of it, but she also I. She doesn't believe me, but I can't tell when she's wearing makeup and not wearing it. Mm-hmm. I think she's just as beautiful. So Yeah, I, Tom, I'm right there with you. Allie likes to wear makeup a lot of times, and I'm thinking, what's the point? You look great without it. And then the sad thing is, I'm say, she says this, um, I can't kiss you right now. I, I just put on some lipstick. I mean, seriously? <laughs> That's the way, then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, Debbie, let, let's see if it, there could be a kind of bit of a fine line because, you know, we just talked about the whole thing about awesome passion beats awesome body mm-hmm. any day. But that also at the same time, it doesn't mean the body doesn't matter at all. The wife shouldn't just say, well, if all he cares about is passion, I'm just going to let myself go and do whatever. Exactly. And there's some women that do that, um, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I don't think that's healthy either. Because we're stewards of the body that God's given us. So, Mm -hmm. you know, our motivation needs to be that we want to be as healthy and as strong as we can be so that we can be equipped and ready to do the things God's called us to do Mm -hmm. and be able to keep up with our spouse and and bless them physically. So, um, you know, there's there's lots of motivation. I think with every good thing, there's a counterfeit that the enemy puts out there to try to distort it or to Mm -hmm. contaminate it. So we've got to be on guard. I mean, there's not any area in our life or in our marriage that is not open to that same um, counterfeit from the enemy. So. De- Debbie, we just talked some about romance also, and we said, for men, romance is a three-letter word, sex. What mm-hmm. is it to a woman, though, exactly? Well, I think romance is um, something that couples share Mm -hmm. between each other, and it's different for all couples. What's Mm -hmm. romantic to one couple won't be to another. Um, And and my husband has adapted to my romantic gestures Mm -hmm. towards him. I love creative dates. I love coming up with new ideas. Sometimes they're really, really stupid, and we don't find out till we try it. And then we end up laughing our heads off for... Mm -hmm. A long time. Sometimes they turn out to be really great. Um, but the but the thing is to always try to do new things, find new ways to express your love to each mm-hmm. other through date night activities. Mm-hmm. Um, we're currently in the midst of a challenge this this year. We're doing alphabet dates mm-hmm. where each of us take a, a letter a month and we plan a date around that letter. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of we want we just became empty nesters. Our last daughter got married in January, and so we decided we needed to have some fun in our marriage because more fun, yeah, more fun. Because yeah. I'm tempted to be sad because my kids have all moved away. So I'm thinking I need to really throw myself more into our marriage and planning fun for us. So I'm not tempted to just be sad. Yeah. And Tom, have you changed the locks yet? Have I changed what? Have you changed the locks yet? <laughs> The locks, what's that? I'm not sure. So, uh, I know some people have said, as soon as the kids move out of the house, we're changing the locks. It's just oh, the two of us. Yeah. No, our, our, they our, moved away. our locks are the same they've been for years. So mm-hmm. um, I don't even know if our kids have keys to the house anymore. But no, we're, we're, we have enjoyed every season of our life. And so this is just a new season, which gives us new freedoms to be able, kind of like the Southwest Air commercials, mm-hmm. we're now free to move about the country. So, um, but it's, it's a great feeling having them. It's a lot easier when they're not here. I mean, knowing that nobody's going to come home definitely leads to um, intimacy times that could be more creative. But. Yeah. Yeah, um, Debbie, I think one of the things also with romance here is that a lot of men make the mistake, I think, that when we start dating, 
our wives mm -hmm. before we get married to them and such. We're just in the dating stage and such. We tend to go all out, you know, take a shower thoroughly, show up with flowers, do everything we can to be the best dates we can be. Then as soon as we get married, it seems to stop for a lot of couples. Yeah, it does. And that's why when we first got married, um, I don't know that we did it when we first got married, but once we started having children, we started planning uh, weekly date nights. Monday night is our date night. Always has been. Mm -hmm. And even if we didn't have money to go out, we would we would just go. We had a babysitter that blessed us. She didn't charge us. So we would just go out and walk, you know, just to get away and have time just for us. Because, you know, once again, Tom was always leading that. We're not going to reach year 20 in our marriage and say, who are you? Because mm -hmm. we've both been so invested in raising our kids that we didn't, we neglected us. Mm -hmm. So we never did. And so, um, and it's, I'm so grateful, especially being at this season now, because um, we have a whole new adventure ahead of us. And you're right. I think one of the things that, that the dating um, in marriage shows is that we're still thinking about, we still care. And you may, I may not have flowers every mm -hmm. time, though I think I know some guys that do that. Um, but it just, one of the things that Debbie hated is if we got in the car for a date night and I said, okay, what do you want to do tonight? Oh, uh, yeah. That, that just said that I didn't think anything about it. Um, mm -hmm. We're doing this just out of routine and I didn't put any thought in it. And mm -hmm. so we've really kind of shared some of that as we've gone through the years of the responsibility of planning a date. It didn't always have to be me that planned it. Mm -hmm. But it was something that, that was other than just dinner and a movie because Movies are fine occasionally, but they don't they don't encourage any communication or any intimacy deeper than just you're sitting together, maybe holding hands, watching a movie. So we would try different things um, that got us out, and got us talking. Mm -hmm. um, yep. We also had what we would call drab date nights, and that does not require a babysitter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on, on nights that we didn't have a sitter, we would plan things where we, we, we might go back to our room and close the door and the kids knew it was date night for us. And whether we just went back and played a board game or did something fun, mm -hmm. uh, it was still intentional. And our kids got to see us modeling, caring for each other and, and making that a priority in our relationship. So it's something that they still do. Our kids have been married for 10, 12, 12 13 years. years yeah. And then our youngest just got married. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can say my wife and I, we really don't have much money coming in at all, but I, I do find a way to get Amazon gift cards and such. And her love language is gifts. And yes. there can be times we can be in the store and she'll see something and she'll really want to say, honey, we, we don't have the money. I, there's no way I can get that for you here now. And then I'll slyly go home, get on Amazon and order it immediately for her. <laughs> Well, yeah. No idea. And to me, it's just that's part of just listening to her, knowing what she likes, knowing yes. what she wants. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, guys, it's pretty obvious. Why wouldn't you do this? Especially since if you're spending a lot of time giving her what she wants, she could be much more prone to spend my time to give you what you want. Right. And there's another point with romance, too, is that yes. I know that there's so many women who think that it's the husband's job to plan date nights yeah. to do things. And so they kind of sit back and say, well, we're not going to go on a date till he plans it. And I, I remember, you know, I think more creative than Tom does. He's gotten much better through the years. But mm -hmm. so I asked him one time, I said, can I plan the dates for a while? And he said, sure. Mm -hmm. So I started doing it and, um, it did two things. It helped me to be able to practice my creativity that I like to do. And then also it took it off the, off of him and it gave me a way of romancing him and, um, in a way that was special. So, you know, I, I, I don't like that myth that women sit back and wait for the husband to do it. Yes, the husband does need to plan things from time to time, but it, it's both. Both of you pursuing each other and planning surprises. Yeah, I, I think we can definitely say it goes the other way of this, but usually when it comes to the bedroom, men are most often the initiators, but I know I, as a man, and many other men, absolutely love it when our wives initiate and make the first move. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something that um, 
again, as we as we continue to see romance or, mm-hmm. or cherishing as something that's not just one sided. Yeah. And we learn really communication a lot. A lot of having a successful, if you want to say, um, sex life really comes down, in my opinion, is a key in communication. Mm-hmm. Learning how to talk, if you're learning how to communicate, if you're learning how to resolve conflicts, if you're able to say what you like and don't like, and you're able to honor and, and cherish each other's wishes that way, then that part of the relationship um, really gets a lot better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, because... If, if I'm correct on what I understand about women the most, it's that uh, too often a guy could come home from work, pretty much say nothing to his wife, ask for dinner, put his feet up on the footstool, t- get the remote, turn on the TV, and mm-hmm. be quiet. And then all of a sudden he somehow expects his wife's going to be feeling frisky in the evening. It doesn't really work that way, does it? Yeah. No, but on the other hand, Nick, there's there's times when those roles reverse, and yeah. women is the woman is the one with the higher libido, and yep. and the guy um, just doesn't see that is not as, as important. Um, I don't understand that, but I <laughs> guys that are like that, and and it's really a challenge for the women too. So mm-hmm. it really has to be something that we look at that part of our relationship as something that's mutual. And something that we're both pursuing because we're really thinking about the other person, mm-hmm. not ourselves. Right. And that's that's one of the keys, I think, in a successful marriage is I'm not thinking about my happiness as much as I am Debbie's. Mm-hmm. And I think something we should also stress is as special as this is, that in our day and age it needs to be said, this is to be kept for marriage itself. Yes, right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things that gives me more freedom in the bedroom is knowing that Tom's not going to talk to anybody else about what we do. Mm-hmm. That's just mm-hmm. it's it's our it's our time. Mm-hmm. And I I love that. And I think men need to realize that that's a way they can protect their wives. Um, you know, no locker room talk. No, you know, any any of uh, things like that. I don't even know why I'm saying that. Maybe there's somebody listening that is tempted to kind of brag to their friends. Mm-hmm. Um, but. You know, that should be something just between the two of you, and you don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, although I can't help remember at one time my wife just said to me, we're getting out, getting out to see some friends, she said, look, if you don't stop smiling, people are going to just know what's been going on and such. And it wasn't <laughs> my talking, but it's like, yeah, I think most guys can understand that. It's the whole, she's talking about this, these like, commercials, the whole smiling Bob commercial. It's like, every yeah. guy understands that. <laughs> that's okay mm-hmm. yeah it's so. okay the smile doesn't doesn't betray trust mm-hmm. <laughs> now we also need to stress that we're talking about Christian marriages what difference does it make that you're a Christian marriage than without I mean how does that affect things well what I emphasize a lot on the blog on our website is um that it's our privilege to be the one relationship on earth that that mirrors Christ's love for the church. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when the world looks at our marriage, they should see a reflection of how much God loves them. Mm-hmm. And so with that mindset, as Christian marriages, we have we're not just committed to each other. We have a responsibility to God. And there's there's a holy reverence along with that. And, uh, it, it's very sobering to realize that it's, it's our, pri- not only our duty, but our privilege to be able to glorify God in the way that we love our spouse, mm-hmm. that it's the one relationship that makes him smile. It gives mm-hmm. him so much pleasure to know that we can enjoy each other, um, as Christ has loved the church and gave himself up for her and the wife also responding, um, with total trust and, and affection. I think, too, of the scripture that says we love because he first loved us. That was on our invitation. And um, to understand the love of God, to understand how he loves us and the sacrifices that he made, even as we're um, celebrating Easter tomorrow and um, his resurrection and his death on the cross and what, what that really meant to means to us as a Christian, that, that love was personified on the cross and it was meant towards us. And so 
I, I think to understand God's love for me helps me to know how to love Debbie. I know she asked me a question when we were on a date one night. How do I see my relationship with God right now on a scale of one to ten? And I said, wow, um, I don't know, maybe a six. And as soon as I said that, I sensed God interrupt my thoughts and just say, really, I see it as a 10 because mm. I can't love you anymore. And I just I fell to the floor there at the restaurant, um, realizing the love of God towards me and then the privilege I have of sharing that with my wife. Mm-hmm. I think the, the world misses a lot of that. Those who are not Christians, mm-hmm. Christian to be a Christian is just a set of rules and a set of duties and a set of things that they have to make themselves get better before they can be a Christian if they even wanted to. Mm-hmm. And really what it is, is God's love towards me teaches me how to love Debbie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for our foes listening, if you're worrying about the resurrection, since we have Easter Sunday coming up tomorrow as of the time we're recording this, by the time you, you hear this, it won't be, it'll be after Easter, but we do have a number of shows we've done on the resurrection here. We've had Gary Habermas on about it. We've had Mike Lacona on about it. We've had Tony Costa on about the resurrection. So if you want to get some good resurrection apologetics, we've got plenty of shows here. And Tom, I liked what you'd said here because sometimes my wife does struggle with her own self-image very... It's very hard to trust me sometimes because she's been hurt by so many people in the past. And mm-hmm. sometimes I can think about going to, going to Jesus and just, I have this hypothetical situation in my mind. I pray that God, I don't get this sometimes. I've d- tried and do so much. I've reached out so much. I've shown so much love and care. I've tried to give it in every way I can. What does it take to get someone to just get her just fall into my arms and trust me immediately and I can hypothetically picture a voice would some back someday say back to me, Hey Bonehead, I've been asking you that for a few decades now, okay? <laughs> right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad that God doesn't treat us the mm-hmm. way that we do him. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So mm-hmm. And the whole idea also is so great about pursuing because I think my wife would say that if the world looked at her, they wouldn't see much. I say, hey, if I look at you, I see my everything right uh, there. I mean, yes. Right. Yes. We, you know, we went to a concert last night. We had some friends get some tickets and they included us there. And Allie's much more into music than I am. And it was a big outdoor thing. And I, and I had my book with me. I was saying, can we turn on these outdoor lights, please, so I can at least read my book here and such? But. I mean, normally the weather was pretty good here in Hotlanta, but it was kind of chilly, you know, so we're sitting out on the lawn on a blanket, and we got another blanket covering us, and I just curl up there and just lie down, and every now and then I'd feel her reach over and just rub my side or my back or something like that, and as soon as she did that, I'd just start smiling immediately. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I've told people, I said, look, if you want to know what, we can be like sometimes just watch the TV show Monk sometime and mm-hmm. see the way that he needs someone beside him just to be able to really function entirely and yeah that's the way we are I always one who makes it so that I can even very really function very well in the world yes <laughs> now yeah if you, let's go back to talking about children some and I, I want to focus on you some since Usually mothers are ones that remain exceptionally attached to their children. And one of the mistakes I think couples make is when children come along, the purpose of a marriage becomes for children. Yes. Yes. That's um, a big temptation for women because our children demand so much of our attention. And when they're first born, babies Mm -hmm. can do nothing on their own. So I I remember that we had some tense times when we first became parents because I, I'm, you know, all, all feeling and I'm right there, um, caring for, Mm. for example, I'd wake up one morning and Tom would say, Oh, the baby slept through the night. And I'd say, no, you slept through the night. (laughs) I was up three times. Mm. You just didn't hear it. (laughs) So, um, but 
you know, God made mothers that way to be attentive at all times for their children. And that's for a season. And it, it's very challenging for a marriage. Um, mm-hmm. The husband needs to be patient and w- and allow his wife to adjust because hormones are involved after the birth of a child. Everything, you know, they're, you know, we've given our whole body to the birth of this baby. And it takes a while for everything to go back to normal, including the emotions. So um, it, it requires a lot of patience on the husband's part and not taking things personally because um, it's just a season and seasons don't last. And even though that's a difficult one, I mean, you know, I think my doctor the first time said that we couldn't have any physical intimacy for six weeks. You know, it, it's like my husband's like, what? <laughs> and, you know, I had no problem with that because my body wasn't feeling so good anyway. So I heard six years. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it was not a fun. That part was not fun. Uh, Mm. But we were lacking a lot of sleep, um, so that helped, you know, to not necessarily be looking for it. But um, all of those things help to grow us up and to teach us that life does not revolve around our wants and our needs necessarily. When you have a baby, Mm. that's the best way to learn that. You have to, you both have to lay down your lives for the good of your baby. Mm. And then when Mm. you get, and you think that's hard, and then you get the second one to come along, and then, then you've got the fighting, the sibling fighting and all of that. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, Mm. no easy way. You need the grace of God when you're walking through those seasons, because it's different for everybody. Some people can just sail through it and have no real difficulty. They just seem like they were born to be parents and they know how to love each other and love their kids and balance it. And then there's other people that, um, I've, I've known women who struggle to connect with their children Mm. and, so, it, you know, you can't stereotype people. Everybody's story is different. Yeah. But everybody's story, if they yield to the, the lordship and will of God, will glorify him in the end. Because he's writing his story in our lives um, to be a testimony that we can share with other people of what God has done for us. Um, so parenting is hard. Absolutely. It's probably the, the most difficult thing you'll face. I think what it meant for me is... You know, I knew now I had to share Debbie with somebody else, as mm-hmm. little as that person was. Um, it was, but it was it was a great time for me too. I love being a dad, mm-hmm. uh, but I I knew anything I can do to help Debbie in her day, um, make it easier for her, would also put her in a place where she can relax and and be able to enjoy times of romance um, after the six years. I mean, six weeks <laughs> that, that he said, but. But if you go beyond that, I mean, each each season changes. And I, um, I I think one of the important things that we tried to make as a priority is continuing to date, continuing to romance one another, cherish one another, even when small children were around. Mm. Because I wanted my children as they grew up to know that mom and dad love each other. Yep. And yeah, I, I wanted them to see that in action. And I also know that many people that pour their lives into their children and neglect their relationship, when their children grow up, get married and move out, they look at each other and go, who are you? Yeah. Uh, and we we made a commitment for that not to happen. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's Every season is different, though. I, I make a reference. Um, see, I've been married for 39 years, but to five different women, mm. but only one marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is every season, my wife changes. When there's, when there's, when we first got married, she was one person. When she was a mom of three small children in the home, she became something else. You know, as she went through times with teenagers and the impact that that put and the stresses that that put on her, she became somebody different. Each one I had to learn how to love and what made her feel special or what made her feel cared for. Then you go through the menopause season and other times, and I God I, help you. <laughs> I, I would come home and, and open the door and kind of crack the door a little, peek in, and go, Debbie, <laughs> Tawanda. You know, I didn't know who was going to be home. You know, he which, renamed my alter ego during which, that which season. Which woman? Five green tomatoes. Yep, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that same thing can happen with women also because. The joke is made around here. It says, 
And I said, yep, I married a nice, good Christian boy. Or so I thought until I got married, and then something changed at that point. <laughs> right, right. I mean, we as, we as men change, too. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Uh, but, Debbie, I do want to about something you said that you said that a husband needs to be patient in that time when this change is going on. But at the same time, that doesn't give a wife a license to say, yeah, you need to be patient. I'm changing here. So just suck up and deal with it. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you can't you can't just, you know, just because you're thinking it doesn't mean you should say it. Yeah. Uh, you know, you as much as he has to be patient, you need to have self-control mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. love your and try to understand what your husband's going through and love them through it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not easy. I mean, we're both, we're two sinners that fell in love and then God brings us together and you, you do this life thing with, um, and sanctification where God is changing you from the inside out and using each other as sandpaper, you know, against each other sometimes. And it's not fun. Um, that's why our focus needs to be on the Lord and loving him primary above all. We can't make an idol out of our spouse, which I think um, you can do that, especially when you're focusing a lot on cherishing romance. If that's your only emphasis that you want to have a, a strong marriage for your own enjoyment, then um, it's not going to work. It's um, I mean, it might work temporarily here, but you know, we have a more eternal perspective for our marriage. We want it to be something that um, the way we love each other will count for eternity um, because we're we're loving our spouse the way Christ has loved us. And I believe that that is accounted to us, you know, as, as righteousness. You know, the Bible says that when we set, am I saying that right? Mm-hmm. That always makes me nervous when I'm saying something on the cuff, but you have to check the reference. <laughs> yeah, I am. I I do think that it's tempting to make a spouse into an idol, but at the same time, I think we should probably become pretty darn close, at least, though, so that the world know that. Yes. Uh, I tell people, you know, I tell you, I say, you know, Jesus comes first, but you are yes. number two on the list right there. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, yes. Mm. And, and we love, we love, um, pursuing the Lord and we do that together. Now in this season, we're able to sit on the couch and in the morning we have a quiet time together. We're both reading the same, um, sections of scripture and then we talk about it, but, um, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be able to do that in this season. We've, mm-hmm. we've not done this before. It's, we love it. Mm-hmm. You know, what about when those hard times do come? So you talk about how you had... You've been married for so long, but 35 of those years, when you said, were happily. Four of them, not so happily. In every marriage, some rain falls. What do you do when the rain comes? Well, I thought it was three years, but she said four, so i got to go back and find out what what the year is that I missed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I think um, you never really know. I mean, each one of those seasons of our life came, when, when things got really difficult, came with, just like one question that came up and mm-hmm. answered it wrong or um, something was interpreted wrong. And then it led down this deep, dark hole that, you know, there was no way out. It seemed like the harder we fought to get out of it, the deeper it pulled us in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was one of those things that we can have a tendency. I, I had to, to think the best. Mm-hmm. During that, and I think we each had to think the best through for for each other, not thinking that we were out to destroy our marriage, but really trying to figure out how we could make it work through that particular time. And we would, like you said earlier, bring in help. Um, we have people that are close to us, people that we look at um, that have kind of been mentors to us in their marriages and how how successful they are, and we'd pull them in. Um, I think it's important to always have people around you um, in different stages of life, whether it's career or whether it's marriage or whether it's parenting or uh, to uh, Christian, your Christian walk, people you look up to and people you pursue to help you grow. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of it, I think, during those years. Yeah, I think I think every one of those years, it was. there was a deep-seated sin issue in our heart 
that it was either Tom's or mine, you know, we each had our different years um, that God was after. And um, in his loving kindness, he was he was pursuing us and he wasn't letting us just float or just drift. But he was he was after um, pursuing that that root sin in our heart that he wanted to set us free from. And it didn't happen easily, you know, and mainly because we didn't know what God was doing. We just mm-hmm. knew we were having conflict and that what was going well before all of a sudden isn't because this has been exposed or, you know, now now you know this about me or I said this and I didn't necessarily mean to, but I did. You know, so you've got all these these things that are issues of the heart that just kind of come spewing out. And then the mess is there and you have to allow the Holy Spirit to walk you through that so that you can repent and and change. Mm -hmm. I think to get real, I mean, just probably just give you an example of what one year was about. Um, Debbie said the comment to me that I think you love me more than you love God. Mm -hmm. And that that just kind of sent me reeling at that time my mind then started to interpret what she said. And I thought I loved God as much as I could. So I thought what I needed to do was love her less then. So Uh during that period of time, I started to pull back my affections towards Debbie. Mm. Um, and, And then that became, like I said, that downward spiral of trying to understand um, theologically and emotionally what she was saying, and if there was any validity to it. Um, I'm, I'm one that would try to figure out if somebody makes an observation. If I don't see it right away, I, I, that doesn't mean I discount it. I would try and ask, you know, is there any truth to this? And I, I did that, but almost too far to the extreme, to where I actually looked at Debbie one night and said, I, I don't think I love you anymore. I don't feel like I don't I feel you. like I love you anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was devastating. So then the Lord was, um, you know, I, it sent me reeling. So then I, I, so the example here is, you know, Tom was, God was after Tom in an issue of personal discipline and pursuing him. He was after me on an issue with pride. So he used me asking that one question. I think you love me more than you love God because you're devoted to our date nights, but you neglect pursuing him personally. That was my, that was how I came to that conclusion. Well, then the Lord used that whole conflict. He was after, he was after Tom. He wanted his affection, of course, but he, I think more than that, he used my own mouth to bring against me this whole pride thing. So one night I'm laying in bed and I'm crying and I don't know how to get my husband back because it had been months at this time. We were leading a home group in our church. We have three teenagers. My husband owned a business. So life is going on as normal. Nobody knows what's going on with us. Um, so, you know, we're trying to fake it. But when we get at home at night in our room, it was cold as ice. So I'm crying out to God, asking him to help. And um, I heard, you know, I, in my heart, I heard him say to me, "Who, Debbie, who made you the standard in judging your husband? <sighs> I, I still tear up when I think of that because what I was doing I was looking at how I pursued the Lord and comparing how Tom pursued the Lord. And I found him wanting. And Mm -hmm. so then God just said to me, who made you the standard? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I, I was undone. So I cried. Um, I repented to Tom of my pride and asked him to forgive me. And he rolled over and went to sleep Mm. because he was still disconnected. Mm -hmm. And then I thought I I had ruined it. I didn't know how to fix it. I figured once I I saw that and I repented, then he would, oh, good, you see it, and now life's good again. Well, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. We made out of that conflict. We Um, did. We still love each other. It was Um, about three or four months, but we made it out finally. Now I love God and I love her. Um, And I'm confident in both of those loves. Um, So it was something we both learned. I, I learned that I could love him more than I did. Um, and at the same time, you know, Debbie had her own things that the Lord was showing her. So, yeah. You know, Tom, I couldn't help but think when you said that about how C.S. Lewis said, we can never love one thing too much. We just love something greater too little. That's right. Mm -hmm. 
That's excellent. Mm-hmm. I wish we had heard that back then. That was some. Where were you about ten <laughs> yeah. 50 or twenty years 20 ago? Years ago. Probably twenty-five years ago. <laughs> Um, I was in high school. Uh, oh, 25 okay. years ago, I was in middle school. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, not trying to do it. Not trying to embarrass you all or anything here, but. <laughs> Some people say, oh, I wasn't even born yet. That's, yeah. At least you were born. That yeah. makes us feel better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think there could be some people listening here who could be like fiancés or just dating and they're thinking about for significant other saying, Oh, we love each other so much. I don't think we could ever get to a point where we'd be that upset with each other. <laughs> just wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll come. I mean, I don't ever. I, it, it's possible for pe- people to have, you know, a lifelong love. And I think we do. We've had some difficult times. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, nobody expects those things. And like I said, it's not something that we either one of us set out to hurt right. one another. Um, but sometimes our words get mixed up and we say things without thinking. And um, mm-hmm. sometimes God's just after something in us to draw us closer to him and closer together. So mm-hmm. it is. Um, yeah, just years will tell. I, I, I don't like going in telling somebody you just wait I think people did that to us when we first got married oh you just wait one year after one year it's going to change or after five years it'll change or after kids and and it didn't for us I mean we continued to grow in our love for one another so to tell people yeah just wait a year or wait 10 years or you know I don't think that's fair either Mm -hmm. Uh, marriage is a wonderful thing Um, Mm -hmm. I also like what you said about having outside help Meantime, my wife and I are both parts of Celebrate Recovery, <clears throat> and one of my, and which she got her seven-month chip for avoiding self-harm last Tuesday, mm-hmm. but we both have sponsors, and a couple of days or so ago, we, we stopped at the grocery store, and on the way home, we get into an argument over something really, really stupid, which yeah. I, I'm sure we are the only couple that ever has that happen. Such, <laughs> and I'm fuming, very angry about everything going on and such. But then I get home and when I just take about a minute or so, I'm like, oh, good grief, what just happened back there and such. And the next thing I know, I am on the phone with my own sponsor and saying, yeah, here is what happened. How can we do better next time? And I'm like, I was hearing this, and she doesn't know I'm from my sponsor. She's like, oh my gosh, she's calling someone complaining about me. And then later on, she figures out, she oh, you were talking to your sponsor. Okay, that makes it different. Because, I mean, sometimes yeah. you don't want to, to share dirty laundry and such, but sometimes it is good to have like one or two trusted people you can talk to about your problems. Yes. Right. That's one thing that Tom always gave me permission that if I. I felt like he wasn't responding to me in a conflict that we were having or if he was being stubborn and digging his heels in. That he, he said, I give you permission to go to so-and-so mm-hmm. and tell mm-hmm. them that what I'm doing. And then mm-hmm. they come and talk to Tom. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know that I ever had to do that. But it was just releasing to me to know that he was that serious about our relationship and not wanting to ever treat me that way. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I think it's good. I think it's good for men to have somebody that they can turn to. And I think women need to. But there's also a caution there. Like your wife was concerned. Oh, who are you talking to? You know, who who are you telling our stuff to? Um, I know that's a real temptation for a lot of women to badmouth their husbands to their friends or to ask their friends opinions about things before they've ever talked to their husband about it first. Mm -hmm. Um, So I make it a point to make Tom's my priority. So I ask him things first. I'll bounce things off of other people, you know, if I need to, but he's my first and foremost because he's my best friend and he knows me better than anybody else. So I know he's going to, he's going to be able to give me the most balanced answer. Yeah. I, I like what you said about how you can have permission to talk to someone else about what's going on. But I think one exception I would make is it should never be any of your parents like oh, that no. to be the arbiter because your parents will always side with Right. Much the child that they have a parent of. Exactly. And I don't, I don't know that we ever talked to our parents about each other because I did, I knew that if I went to my mom that she would, she would defend me, but then she would also have an issue with Tom. She'd be mad at him. 
Mm-hmm. And then I, I didn't want that either. So, you know, it, it's not good that that leaving and cleaving in the Bible is mm-hmm. for a reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it your, The health of your marriage depends on you being able to cut that tie quickly. Not that you don't love your parents and you still ask their advice about things. Yeah. But when it comes to your uh, marriage relationship, unless you both agree. Now, we know in our church, we've got some parents who are, are are great friends now with their married children and they choose no one else to go to to counsel with they they want their parents you know um, input on certain mm-hmm. issues and so you know it, again you can't standardize everybody and say it's this way across the board but as a rule norm you know you would want to good to have somebody else yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. and that's your parents can like show that they can be very objective about both of you, so it's a, so if, right. for instance, if it's me, that's a problem, and we end up talking to my parents, my parents need to be able to look at me and say, hey, Nick, you're being an idiot right here, okay? Yes. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. They might take her side. <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, I, I like what she said about leaving cleave as well, because for the parents listening, they need to realize that's going to happen right. with marriage and such. I know it was extremely hard on my mother, for instance, when I was getting married, because, hey, I was her baby or her right. life and such. And then all of a sudden, here comes this other woman in my life, and lo and behold, she's being number one, and that is a huge change. Yes. Now, now Debbie, you've been through something like this. What advice would you say to mothers who might who don't know how to handle us you were saying i used to be my kids my son's number one what's happened here right well i i think because marriage is such a important uh, thing to us and we we live and breathe it i think when our kids got married i knew very well that my role was coming to an end as far as um, being the number one woman in my son's life mm-hmm. um and I, you know, in the process through the engagement and going through all of that, there was a dying to my attachment. But I found great joy in seeing how much he loved his new wife. Yeah. And it helps that I absolutely adore her. I mean, mm. she's um, and then my my son said, she reminds me of you, mom. It's like, oh, my. OK, how can I <laughs> thank you? Mm. You know, because she's great. I just love her. And so I think that helps. And I also have, I have an awesome daughter-in-law. I know there's some, yep. some guys that marry women whose their, their fiance has an issue with his, you know, there could be jealousy. There could be, you know, personality conflicts. Um, that's hard. That's mm-hmm. difficult. And I, I think the, the husband in that case needs to support his wife. Yeah. Um, and unless she's acting sinfully, you know, mm-hmm. You can't again. You can't say across the board. It, every situation is different, but um, yeah. I think that it, it's definitely hard to realize on that wedding day that when you're walking them down the aisle, that it's going to be different from here on out. That this and it hit us the most with our first daughter when she got married because then all of a sudden we have this other person that we don't know that well, that's going to be at all of our holidays, all of our events, everything. And now, and he's going to become like a son to me, but right now I don't know him that well. So that's, it's, it's weird, but we, we pursued all of our kids, um, spouses, like they're our own kids and tell them that that we're going to treat them as if they're our own kids. And we love them because we've prayed for them since our kids were little. Yep. So it's like they've been a part of our heart. We just yep. didn't have a name or a face to them yet. <laughs> I know my in-laws see me that way. Sometimes it's, I actually go on Facebook and I can see my mother-in-law's post because my dad, my father-in-law wasn't on Facebook when we were dating and married. And I can go back to the engagement period and things like that and see what she was saying about us and, yeah, this is really good to see and such. Yes. And my my own parents do treat Allie like they like she's their own daughter and such. Mm-hmm. At the same time, there, there was one time though that my we lived next door to my parents for a while, and my mother came over, and she did say something very negative about Allie there, and I certainly didn't like it. And I just said to her, I said, mother. 
This is my wife. This is a woman I love. And you are not going to come into my house and speak about her that way. Just lay it down because... I mean, yeah, that's the way it needs to be because it's it's impossible for a daughter-in-law to confront her mother-in-law without it becoming you know an all-out battle. So, but if the if the husband steps in and defends his wife, but of course with love to his mom, yeah, uh, then it's going to stick mm-hmm. for the most part, unless you know the mother-in-law is just un- very unreasonable. Um, I can say for now, though, one of the greatest stories I do see is when my wife does talk to her mother-in-law on the phone and they get along great. Uh, I, I love seeing that. Yes. Right. Yes. I'd like to remind everyone at this point, you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast. we got Debbie and Tom Walter on. We have the authors of the book, Cherishing Us. But if you're here next week... Now, next month, as you know, is Autism Awareness Month. And I always try and have at least one guest on to talk about autism and things of that sort. And we're going to have two shows dedicated about this, dedicated about this year. But um, next week, sometimes people ask me, Nick, who's been your favorite guest you've had on the Deeper Waters podcast? And I would say, you know, that is so hard to decide. There have been so many great people. I don't know. Where... After next week, that is going to be a very easy question for me to answer because I'm getting guests that I think is going to be my favorite guest of all time. And I'm sure Debbie and Tom could be listening thinking, well, oh, geez, what about us? But they're going to understand it very soon. So is it, is it N.T. Wright, William Lane Craig, Edward Fesser? Nope, none of those. Next week, my wife is going to be sitting right beside me here for the Deeper Waters podcast, and I am going to be interviewing her about Asperger's and our relationship together and what it's been like for her on the autism spectrum. So now I'm sure everyone can understand, yes, this is my favorite guest to have on the show, is to have my wife right next to me. So I've talked about her for so long. Next week, you are going to get to hear her speak for yourselves. It all started with a small-time dream. Hold a conference in a church. With a small budget, could we afford to bring in a Christian celebrity speaker? And with an ear to hear more than just the same canned messages, do we want to? With these two questions, the mentionables were born. We found the best under-the-radar Christian apologists that we could find. Writers, podcasters, and bloggers. Their voice was small, but their message was huge. On May 18th and 19th, The Mentionables will be appearing in Greensboro. Head out to Greensboro Christian Church and hear this grassroots phenomena in action, featuring talks and a great debate. Head over to thementionables.org to get your tickets, or call Greensboro Christian Church at 336-621-5226. The Mentionables. Small-time voices, big-time noise. Let's get back to Debbie and Tom here talking about their book, Cherishing Us. Now, when you were uh, when you were writing this book, how did you how how did you do this? I mean, were, was it was it difficult to come up with three hundred sixty five things, or did you end up having to cut a whole lot of things, or what? Well, actually, um, we have probably over five hundred healthy marriage tips that mm-hmm. we've done on our Facebook page for years. Mm-hmm. Um, we we would share that and people would share them and like them and everything. And mm-hmm. probably about four or five years ago I got the idea to make this book. And so I asked Tom about it and he says, Yeah, let's do it. And so I said, let me see how many we have. I was thinking 365 and see how many more we need to get. That's when I found out we had a lot more than 365. So actually, there is 366 in here. I do have February 29th for those mm-hmm. leap year fans. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went through and we had them all. And so I, I put it in. I, we have a Mac. And so the Mac offers a, um, an e-reader. You can make a, um, an e-book. So I didn't know how to do that. So I was just playing around with it and putting it together and formatting it and came up with the seasons idea because that goes with our, our website, The Romantic Vineyard. Um, And just kind of compiled it. Well, then I forgot about it. My mom ended up dying and I went through a lot in emotionally and Mm -hmm. it just kind of got shelved. And then I had a friend in October that um, he's the head of our writers group that I'm a part of. And he said he was going to be starting a publishing company and Prevail Press, which is who produced this book. And so he, he was telling me about it. So I was thinking for my next 
um, historical novel that I've written, I want to write another one. So I was going to write one day. And so I opened up my computer and I was looking in my writing folder and I found this book. And I went, oh, my goodness, what's this? And so I looked through it and I found that it was almost ready. I mean, I needed to add a few things. So I, I let my friend know who's doing the Prevail Press. And he said, well, let me see it. And so it ended up going from just a conversation in October to being published the end of February. I mean, it was just it was a God thing. It just happened so quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we're still kind of shaking our heads that it's here and um, and love the timing of God. I mean, it, it started March 1st. So because we start with spring in the vineyard and it was released the end of February. So it was perfect timing, mm -hmm. you know, right Valentine's Day and um so it, it started on Facebook just as a healthy marriage tip because so many people talk about the trouble they're having in marriage. Mm -hmm. And our goal with the Romantic Vineyard is to infuse the positive, to show people, you know, we can be so problem focused or sin focused in our marriage that we forget to pursue the good. And sometimes that's all we're lacking. If we just purpose to pursue the good part of our relationship then the, the little irritations and stuff will diminish. They won't bother you as much. Mm -hmm. um, so that's our goal. We want this book to be, it's a, every, every day is just one thought. It's one or two sentences and you just read it and think about it that day and maybe talk about it. What did you think of that tip? Mm -hmm. And you know, some will apply to you, some won't. Um, so it's, it's just meant to be a tool to help you stay focused on the good in your marriage. Yeah. I, think one of the, I think one of the tips that we have in the book is that, that one good encouragement could last last you a week. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, we just need to continue to look in our relationship and try and catch each other doing things right. I'm, I'm a troubleshooter. I'm a problem solver. And it's real easy for me to just focus on things that aren't correct or things that are broken, try and fix them. And instead, I, in, in my relationships, I need to find people doing things good, whether it was with, and our, with Debbie and me or with my children. I need to be focused on encouragement 80% of the time and only correcting 20% of the things rather than having that flip flop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes, Tom, that's a mistake we men often make because when our wives have some sort of problem, we want to jump in and say, okay, let's fix it, let's fix it. And the wife, it's the same way of saying, I just want to talk about it first. I don't, I don't need this problem. So I just want you to listen to me. And to me, as a man, that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, I mean, in, what, what do you two think about that? I don't know if you've seen it or not. It's going around on the Internet for a long time. But that what about it's not about the nail. Yeah, I know that one. <laughs> and, and that's kind of that that community. I just want you to listen to me. I just want you to hear. But I can fix it. I know, you know, no, that so. It's not about fixing things, I think. Sometimes that we just, our wives need to know that we're just there and we're here to listen. Now, we're not ever going to be their girlfriend. No. Uh, but at the same time, I think that we as men can do better in honing our listening skills. Um, I, I, I've had to work on that and I still continue to work on that because when Debbie would be talking to me, to me what I would normally be doing is formulating my response after yeah. she said something mm. rather than completely listening to her after she has said something and, and hear the rest of what she's saying. I was just waiting for her to stop talking so I can give her my wise advice to change. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Try, it with, try it with being a Christian apologist who's supposed to be able to answer everyone at times. It makes it even harder. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, that's that's been something I've I heard a long time ago, you know, that God gave us two ears and one mouth. So we need to listen twice as much as we talk. And mm. I'm trying to do that. Yes. Now, Debbie, Tom was just saying that, yes, that is important to do. But so many of the men out there could be listening, saying, yeah, I get that that's what you want us to do. But it still doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you want us to just listen about Paul instead of? doing what we can to take care of a problem immediately. Because I think when you want to try to fix the problem immediately, you're, we feel like we're just another item on your to-do list. Mm -hmm. Check, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And not caring. It's not that I don't want to hear his input and his advice. I just want him to listen to everything that's on my heart to get the full picture. 
because <laughs> most guys live in the headlines and women live in the fine print. So yeah. they just you just pay attention to the headline and they think he thinks he has an idea of what I need and then in most times it's not exactly what I'm after. You know, it's more in the and it takes me a few sentences or maybe minutes or hours, who knows, depends on what it is, to get to the meat of what it is that I'm really needing help with. Mm -hmm. Um, Most people, we don't start talking right away what's really bothering us. We have smoke screens that we throw out and we start talking. And then as, as you see that the person you're talking to is trustworthy, then you'll start giving more detail and then even more and more. And I think we do the same with our spouses sometimes. We, you know, especially if we've been put off before, you know, I, I, I may not tell him exactly all the deep issues right away. I want to see if he's in the right mindset mm-hmm. and if he's really listening to me before I'm going to go there and be, um, I, I don't want to be ignored or pushed aside. So I had to, I have to learn to listen, to understand, not listen, to just respond. Yeah, um, and and ask questions and, mm-hmm. and get involved in her talking and thinking. Um, and it takes work because he doesn't think like me. Nope. He's very logical. I'm very um, emotional. We even did the Myers Briggs test, and poor Tom, I'm a hundred percent on the feeling side. So <laughs> there's nothing on the logic side whatsoever. So he's balanced. So he um, helps me become more logical in my thinking. And over the years, I have become much more logical. And that's just a, a, his influence and the mercy of God. Mm-hmm. And if, if you've read a lot of marriage books, you've also heard, you know, that, that women have more words than men do. So um, women are appointed more words in a day. And in mm-hmm. the typical day, I mean, I have I may have 10,000. She has 50,000. I've used my 10,000 up before I get home from work. And she's only had a few so um, look, out. look out, those words are coming. Um, yeah. But you know what? I, if she wasn't here tomorrow, I would miss those words. Yep. You know, I know in our, in our marriage, I'm definitely much more intellectually focused mm-hmm. and such. And Ari's much more of emotionally focused. But I've found that, yes, I've become much more emotional since yes. she's come into my life. And at the same time, I've seen her become much more intellectual. Like when I see her arguing with something or making some point, I think, by God, that was a very good point. Whereas she can catch someone in a logical fallacy. I'm just going, yes! yes. yes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's awesome to me. That's great. You know, Nick, I think that's something of what the Lord says when he says the two are becoming one, yeah. or the two have become one. It doesn't happen instantly. Yeah. It does in some sense. It happens in the covenant side of things. That's an instant thing. But for for all the other parts of our relationship, that takes a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, for me, the way I see it is I, I've told people are getting married is one of the greatest routes to sanctification because if I wind up being a jerk... I mean, I'm not the only one affected. I see someone who I love very much who is directly affected by me being a jerk. I'm like, ooh, gosh, I gotta stop that. And then at the same time, I'm thinking, I have called my wife a princess ever since we started dating. And that name has stuck. And where I see it, I'm married to royalty. I'm married to the best woman on earth. And I think, my guy, I want to be a better man just because I want to give her the best person that I can. And not right. just the best person I can, the best me that I can. I mean, sometimes, yeah, that's she, excellent. sometimes my wife would think, well, I, I just think sometimes someone could do better. I said, honey, no one can do better at being you than you. And I want you, not some abstract you are the one I want. And so with sanctification, I look and say, I want to be a better person because I've been given a great gift and I want to be so grateful to it and live my life knowing that this is a gift, <laughs> you know. Right. So me and my friend, some of my friends who are still single, I just someone say to them, if you knew how awesome marriage is and such, you might be pushing for it a lot more. I mean, not all of them will get married, but sometimes I wouldn't say, yeah, you, you really don't know what you're missing here. Mm-hmm. Well, the world's doing a lot today to try and redefine marriage and what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, to minimize the 
the importance, the, the sanctity of it. Um, so that's why I appreciate things you're doing in, in, in your in ministry and, and the things that we're trying to do as well with the Romantic Vineyard. Mm-hmm. Keep that uh, priority of marriage a focus um, and how God sees marriage a focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Debbie, I like something you said about the stuff in your books that not all of it will apply to every couple because some couples are different because one thought that came to my mind is let's suppose it's around January here in mm-hmm. our marriage and it's this event called Super Bowl Sunday coming up. Yes. There will be one person here who is fully, fully excited about it, wanting to watch the TV, see who wins the game and such. There will be one person here who is something good grief, this is some of the most ridiculous stuff I've ever seen. I don't understand it at all, and I absolutely can't stand the season. But if you're thinking about the way marriages usually are, it's the exact opposite in ours. Yes, okay. Yep. Yep. She's a... Super Bowl Sunday's always been interesting here, because as much as, you know, myself and my son and some others would like to watch the game, Debbie's all about themes and about making parties happen and doing all that. So she would take whatever team say it's Philadelphia and New England that are playing. She's going to have Philly cheesesteaks. She's going to have New England clam chowder. She's going to be planning everything around all of those things, making themes match, having something in each quarter. And we're, we just want to watch the game, mm-hmm. and, you know, but we enjoy the food. Yes, you do. We do enjoy the food. Yes. Well, that's probably another difference because you ever said the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Yep. Never met me because that will not work at all. <laughs> and when when the Super Bowl comes on, Allie gets really really excited. About it. I have my book with me and I put it down. Watch the commercials. That's it. And I don't really know what's going on the rest of the time, and I don't really care. But that's part of the thing that makes it part of the thing that every couple is different. And that's there are no doubt other marriages out there that are the same way that. The wife has much more of an interest in something that's usually seen as a guy thing right. than the guy does. Yep. Well, I think that was that was one of the things that Gary Thomas said in his book, Cherish, um, that was really good, too. He gave him the analogy of him coming out, and uh, they were they were somewhere, I thought it was maybe a, a nursing home or something, they came out, and he was going to, um, his, his wife was going to get in the car, they had separate cars, and there was a big puddle by the by her door and so he just put his hand out to get the keys to move the car for her and he said now this this probably wouldn't work in every relationship if if your wife was a nascar driver she'd probably be offended the fact that you wanted to move her car she'd say i'm I'm not only going to move it myself i'm going to beat you home you know so Mm -hmm. marriage advice like you said it isn't something that fits every marriage everyone is different Mm -hmm. but i think some of the basic principles fit every marriage right yeah yeah, and naturally, the principle is about just loving one another, but you have to do it in the right loving ways. Because, for instance, if a marriage said, let your husband watch the game on Saturday night or whatever, I could read that and think, I don't know what to do with that because he doesn't watch the game on Saturday night. He doesn't care about it. But, of course, she could be, she could take and say, if he wants to uh, turn on the PlayStation and play a game on Saturday night, let him do that some and such. Yeah. I mean, you, you just have to find the corresponding thing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's the heart behind the issue, not necessarily the issue itself. Mm-hmm. And I, I think when we talk about these kind of things, we can also talk about love languages some. Because yeah. every marriage expert knows about the love languages. And yeah. the thing is, right. you have to learn to be fluent in the other person's language. My my wife's language is gifts. And so usually I'm looking to see what I can do to gift her. We were walking up the mall a couple of Sundays or so ago. And like I said, I always have Amazon credit. And she saw a game at GameStop that she'd been warning and said, I just don't know if it's on the PlayStation app, but I've been wanting to try out this game. So we keep walking on, and she's not noticing, but 
I'm on my iPhone immediately, looking at Amazon. Okay, it's on my PlayStation. Okay, wait, look, there's something in digital code. Message my former roommate, who was my best man. What's this digital code thing? How does this work? Is it, well, you, you buy the digital code from Amazon, and it automatically installs the game onto your system. So you can just play it immediately. It's like you put the disc in. Yeah, okay, thanks. You can get home, order that immediately, load it up on my PlayStation, boom. There you go, honey. Because yeah. that's... Her love language. Now, that's good. Now, to an extent, some gifts could work fine for me if she got me a game that I really liked. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. But what me matters most to me is my love languages are words of affirmation and physical touch, which is really odd because I don't like anyone else touching me but her. But. If she comes and she gives me some great compliment about myself and such, I'm yeah. I'm sitting pretty. And like I said, when we were at that concert last night, and she reaches out and she just rub me gently, or something like that. That is yeah. moment. Yep, I'm in paradise right <laughs> now. It, it, it's like think about the way a puppy acts when it when it gets rubbed and such. That's pretty much the way I was doing. Right. Well, I think Deb, Debbie is different. You've heard of some people being multilingual or, yeah. or bilingual. Debbie yeah. is multilingual when it comes to love languages. <laughs> she um, she has them all, you I'm know. So she's fluent in all of them. Mm. So it's it's easy for me to do that. I think one of the the drawbacks that we have to be careful with in love languages, mm-hmm. though, is that we don't say that I don't say to Debbie, "You're not loving me the way." I need to be loved or my, my love language is words of affirmation. Then you're not giving me enough of that. Or you're not, you know, if we demand it, it, it loses something. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it should be my, it's my job to study him, to know his love languages and to do that for him. At the same time, he's studying me and doing the things that are meaningful to me. And um, you can the, talk about it. You can talk about it, but you can't stand with a measuring line to mm-hmm. see, you know, how your spouse is doing. Not with that. Not with a judgment. You know, you can say, "Can we talk about something?" and and just bring it up. You know, when you do this, it ma- means so much to me. But it seems like lately you haven't been thinking that way. Is mm-hmm. everything okay? Right. You know, kind of bring it that way rather than you never. You know, those are the two. We, we, we don't use absolutes. We don't say you never or you always, blah, 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 unless it's positive. Mm. You never talk bad about me or you always love me in a mm. great way. That, yeah. Those are allowed, but it, as far as critical judgments, um, no, no absolutes. Yeah. I'd like to, before we get further, I'd like to remind everyone at this point, you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast. And everything we do here is listener-supported by people like you. And I really want to encourage you to come to our website, deeperwatersapologetics.com. And if you go on there, you'll see a link on the side, Help Support the Work of uh, Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. And you click the link in there, and you get taken to Risen Jesus Ministries. Nope, there's not a malfunction Everything's working fine on your computer. You come to the right place. That's my in-laws, Mike and Debbie Lacona. You go there, and you make your donation, and then you get in touch with Mike and Debbie or me or Ali and say, Hey, I made a donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. We will get that donation. It will be tax deductible. And also, if you want to, you can go on... Um, Amazon, you can buy ebooks that I have either written, such as A Creed for the Ages, The Apostles' Creed in Today's Christian, or co written books such as Defining Inerrancy, or Godless, or, or Groundless, I mean, or God and Natural Disasters, and others. And you can also, uh, now, guys, we just talked about gifts, okay? Debbie, can you confirm something for me? Do you. Do most women like jewelry? Uh, I would say probably yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's some that don't. I think um, I can think of a few in my family. My sister-in-law, number one, I don't know that she loves wearing lots of jewelry. Um, but I would say it's a pretty good assumption unless you've learned otherwise. 
um, one thing with us, Tom, when we first got married, he worked for a jewelry store. And so he likes real jewelry, which I love real jewelry too, mm-hmm. diamonds, gold, all of that. But what he didn't understand is that I love cheap costume jewelry too that looks nice. And if it only lasts a couple of years, I'm happy with that because by then it's out of style anyway. But um, it took a while for him to figure out that he could buy me something that's not three hundred dollars. It would be twenty bucks, and I'd be happy. Mm-hmm. So that's one of those little mm-hmm. details. You know, it doesn't have to be expensive jewelry to bless your wife. Well, I say that because guys, we have a jewelry store here at Shirley. Uh, oh. Our friend Lena Klesser runs has her own jewelry, and she works with us in that if you purchase something from her and say it's for deeper waters, whatever you purchase, the price will be the same. Whatever it is, 25% of that will go to deeper waters. So, guys, you can buy something very special for that lady in your life, and you're... You'll be able to donate to the ministry, and it doesn't just have to be for your wife or your girlfriend, because, hey, Mother's Day is coming up, and I'm sure your mother would like something nice. And, guys, you know the advice I always give you about buying jewelry. You can buy something special of that lady in your life to make up that big screw-up that you recently did with her, or you can buy something special of that lady in your life to make up for that big screw-up that I know you're going to make with her. And if uh, you can't do any of these, guys, please go on iTunes and leave a positive review of the Deeper Waters podcast. I really love to see them. I love it when you all get in touch with me and say, hey, I've been listening to the show. I love the show. I really enjoy the show and things of that sort and such. It's it's something awesome to hear. Now, Debbie and Tom, do you all have some organization or charity you'd like to see people donate to? Um, I... I can't think of one off the top of my head other than our local church. I mean, that's where we we give through and um, mm-hmm. send out to missions and stuff through our church, mm-hmm. uh, Metro Life Church in Castleberry, Florida. Okay. Do you have the website right off? Or? Yes, it's metrolife.org. Okay. So if you all want to donate, donate to Debbie and Tom's church as well and such. No. But to your point, you can buy jewelry for somebody for no reason at all, too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, also, when it comes to the love languages that we're talking about, I think one of the mistakes we can make is too often we kind of expect the other person to speak our love language. If I see Allie and I come up behind her and I t- put my hands on her shoulders and such, I mean, to me, that's physical touch. That speaks romance, baby. Uh-huh. And for her, it can more often speak annoyance than anything yes. else. And for her, sometimes some of the things that she really likes, I'm thinking, no, I don't understand. I mean, for me, I can say, when we talk about music, for instance, we have very, very different tastes. So the things that she gets really excited about in that area, I'm thinking, um, I'm not sure if this really qualifies as music here. I mean, that... <laughs> It, that is a struggle we have that we think that the way we want to be loved is the way the other person wants to be loved. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yes, we need to, you know, that's very true, but we can't, you know, just like you said, that when you go up behind Allie and you and you hug her, or touch her, mm-hmm. to return, turn around for her, and I don't know that she does this, but to turn around and go, ew, I don't like that you know, then that's kind of throwing cold water in your face because you were doing something that was meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know that we should give ourselves license to do that. Mm -hmm. If my husband is loving me in a way that I know is his love language, it's still love to me, Mm -hmm. even though it doesn't mean as deep to me as it does to him. Mm -hmm. I find pleasure in it knowing that he's expressing his love in a way that's special to him. Yeah. And if we can have that mindset, it helps not to be reactionary to um, to that. Because that's not treating our spouse. It's not cherishing them. Um, we, you know, I don't think that we're ever given permission to react in a negative way to our spouse that way. I think one of the things that's important um, to do is to study your spouse. Mm-hmm. We, we, we really do need to study to get to... I say get to know them. Even after 39 years of marriage, I can still study Debbie 
in the things of the current season that are important to her. And in this, I mean, she's always loved her, her feet to be rubbed. I can pretty much count on every night if we're sitting on the couch, her shoes will come off if they're not already off, and her feet will land in my lap, and I know what that means. Mm. She wants to rub her feet. Um, and so, you know, now I know that's that's even more important for her because her feet hurt a lot. And so, mm. but even before that, it was just important to her. If I was to just kind of ignore that or push her feet out or go, feet, feet ooh, you know, I mean, <laughs> these these are precious feet to me. So yeah. it's it's just learning, learning your spouse, showing interest, showing care and 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 acting on that, demonstrating that. Yeah, we have, my wife doesn't do the ew thing and such. She she lets me give her a hug and such, which I yeah. really like and such. But and I I also thought of thing just now with gifts. I mean, I've got two things I usually always have with me. One of them is this little pocket watch, and for watching it, I have to be set every day, so I don't even bother with it. But it's got a phoenix on it, which Allie knows I love those, and I carry it with me everywhere. <clears throat> and the other one is. Something I wear around my neck, an ocarina from The Legend of Zelda, the Ocarina of Time. And I was like, why do you have those things with you always? No matter where we go, you always have them with you. I said, because you gave them to me. That's it. That's <clears throat> that's the gift thing. What makes the gifts so special the most is they are from her. And anytime I'm out there, I can get a reminder that that's her gift to me. And it could be on the spectrum. We also can get attached to objects and such. But these objects are so special because... They come from her, and I can say also that once when we were dating, actually, I did wash her feet for her, because she said, my feet are gross. No one would ever want to touch my feet. It's a challenge accepted. Yes. Yes. Yep, her pet, her mother and her were visiting, and they were staying at this hotel once, and I went over there to their room and took her out of the bathroom, and I just washed her feet for her right there. And for me, who's a real much more germophobic kind of person and such, doesn't like to touch email, could be icky and such. It was just yeah. a huge thing to say, I care about you this much, and we weren't even engaged yet. <laughs> wow, that's really sweet. Uh, and I guess my comment of not just my feet, but my head and my... <laughs> <laughs> You have to be careful if you're not engaged yet. Yeah, yeah, that, that win I've worked as well, man. <laughs> Especially with her mom in the, in the room with you. <laughs> well, she was in the next room, but it was close enough. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, I, I think that is something also we could, could say that couples who are dating and such... Yes, you do need to be having regular expressions of intimacy and such in preparation for marriage. But at the same time, be very careful because it is very tempting to cross that line yes. and such. And there's nothing wrong with having a strong desire for one another. But save that desire for a proper time and place. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I think that's one of those things that that's wise counsel. And, you know, you can become... Um, close in, in just your communication in a lot of other words. The, phys- the physical part of things, we always caution folks that I think the same caution that I heard when I was growing up is that once you light that fuse, it's hard to put it out. And yeah. so there is a time for that. The Bible cautions us not to wait passion before it's time, you know. Um, so that's good. Yeah, I think that's probably reasons why some wives can, can say, um, what happened to this person that I thought I was going to marry? I mean, like, said so my wife, I would say, yeah, I wanted to marry a good Christian boy, but something happened after we got married. I don't know what it is, but something happened. And saying, yeah, I know exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. I think one of the old things that I've heard is that... And, I mean, I am cautious about Christians blaming the devil for everything. But the sentiment behind it is the same. It says, before you get married, the devil will do anything he can to get you to have sex together. After you're married, he'll do anything he can to get you to not have sex together. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's that's about as black and white as you can get. That's really good. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... Why then? Why? 
sounds we can miss. Why is this so important in a relationship, in a marriage relationship? What difference does it make? Sexual relationship. The sexual relationship yeah, part? Being, you yeah. mean in waiting until marriage? You know, when you are married, what? why is sex so important? What difference does it make? I think many times, and I've said this, and I know I, you know, can build bridges around um, mm-hmm. some of the different things that would cause it to be different, but I've always judged that as part of the barometer of a marriage for our marriage anyway. And I know we go through physical seasons or the time, like we said, the six weeks after having a baby or other things that are challenges. But I think for that part, it's it's um, it's the closeness. It's the the sense of um, being naked and unashamed. Yeah. Um, the, you know that part of being totally known, mm-hmm. uh, like no one else will or you know know me. Um, and being comfortable that way and knowing that that Debbie looks at me in a way that um, that makes her excited and and the same thing when I look at her it just it brings the relationship to a deeper level mm-hmm. uh, maybe you can help me with that one but well I think I think the sexual relationship is um, it's unique in that it's the only, it's the only aspect of your marriage that you only share with your your spouse. Yeah. You have you have connections with other people emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, but as far as physical intimacy, your spouse is the only one mm. that um, that you either give that to or they give to you, and it's precious mm-hmm. and it should be guarded. And I I know so many couples struggle in this area, but I don't. For the most part, I don't think it's the physical relationship that's the struggle. It's other things, other issues that are are going on in the marriage that need to be resolved, yep. which help. Now, I realize there are a lot of couples that they bring they bring garbage into the marriage. You know, they've got shame, they've got past abuse, they've got you know history in the sexual realm that every time they get close to their spouse, it's just a reminder of that horrible experience. And, you know, that that's going to take deep counseling and help from from God to bring healing to those areas. Um, Don't ignore it. It won't go away. It has to be it has to be dealt with. And a husband, especially, you know, when it's the wife that's bringing that in, um, a husband that understands his wife and can give her the love and comfort without an expectation of it always leading to sex um, will go a long way in earning her trust Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's several other marriage bloggers that that's their focus is all on couples that are struggling in this area because it's so prominent. It's such a it's a big issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd like to kind of combine something that you both said together that Tom had said it's like a barometer the way I've described it. I heard it described from a pastoral counselor when he gave us a card of tips when we were engaging him. He said, sex is a thermometer that measures the temperature of a marriage. And I go with what you said, Debbie, that usually if there's issues there, it's because there are other issues elsewhere like communication and mm-hmm. things of that sort and such. I mean, for me, it's when that part's going well in marriage, the message I'm getting loud and clear for instance is wow I am trusted this much I, I, things matter this much to me but if it's not fair it's kind of like okay where's our relationship and such and I think that could be much more of a case for men and such that if that aspect isn't there we feel neglected like we don't matter and for me my own wife's body is really the most beautiful sight I ever see, and I I sound like it it could be also because I'm a nerd, because if you grow up and you're a nerd, you usually get rejected by every other girl, I mean, when you find one who actually really loves you and such, you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, me, me, you actually chose me, you actually love me and such, and it's just mind-blowing to Mm -hmm. us, but I mean, I, I, but every time I look and say, this is the most beautiful sign of how much I am trusted and how much I mean, and 
I think, Tom, you agree. That's why we want wives to be passionate and excited because we want to say, getting to be with you is a privilege, and I want you. And now instead of just what's usually called duty sex, which, okay, let's just go and give this over with, okay? Right, yeah. right. Well, I think one of the important things um, for me to realize is something that, again, I never had an original thought in my life. I don't think everything that I say I borrowed from somebody, but mm. the whole thing of, touching my wife's heart before I touch her body, Mm -hmm. you know, and knowing that, that uh, although I'm not really trying to, in the things that I do all day long, whether I'm saying something or doing the nice things or doing the gifts or helping with housework or anything that way, it's not so that that night ends up good in the bedroom. Yeah. It sure makes it a lot easier for her to put her mind in the right place. I know for women, it's at least for my wife, it's one thing for her. She her her head, she can't just switch from doing something very stressful to all of a sudden now be thinking romantically. Yeah, it, it, I have to kind of get that engine primed and and get the the boat kind of headed in the right direction. And so as as through the whole day, I'll be doing things that will help her put her in a place where she's ready for that at night. And it doesn't necessarily mean that if that night something doesn't happen, it, it doesn't culminate in an explosive romantic event, I'm not going to, you know, I've, I've got to condition my heart not to respond negatively to, to give her grace to have an off night when things don't come together for both of us. But if we at least know where we're headed in, in the direction of what our passion is and what our desire is for each other, then we can both head in that direction together. Yeah, I like what you said, Tom, about the reason you do things. There was a time when we lived in Charlotte, and the pastor's wife was picking up my Allie, because Allie can't drive. She was picking her up for a uh, for an event together. They'd be gone all day, and our apartment was a mess. And I thought, I was just cleaning it up. That means so much to Allie when she gets home. And so I go, and I'm going through cleaning. About halfway through, I'm think, I'm feeling really good about things. Like, gosh, she is going to be so surprised when she gets home. She is going to be so happy, so excited. You know, I bet she'll just want to come home and romance me and take me straight to the bedroom and think, oh my gosh, what if that is why I'm doing this? And it really bothered me that that could have been the case. I don't think it was because that hadn't struck my mind to him, but... When I meet guys who kind of think that way, I tell them now that the way I've decided is, even if you think you could be doing something for it, the wrong motives and such, if it's the right thing to do, do it anyway and pray and say, God, help me with my motives. Right. Well, it's the doing because you're cherishing, not doing because you're expecting something. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the expectation that we have is just how do I, we, you know, I think talk about outdo one another in showing yeah. up. Yeah, uh, you know, and so that's it's more about the honoring, more about the cherishing than it is about setting the stage for an end result. You know, Debbie, we've talked about what this aspect means to a man mm-hmm. and such. So, I mean, for a man, it just means he's trusted, he's desired, and things like that and such. Usually, women seem to be get the impression that women just aren't very really interested in this. This is something for the men and not for women, but. This does matter for women, too. What does a good relationship in the bedroom mean to a woman, exactly? I think it's it's um, not only being desired by your husband, yep. but also being um, understood. Yep. Um, and whatever all those issues might be, mm-hmm. I think, like I said earlier, women, a lot of women can have past experience or past yeah. perceptions of what good sex or bad sex looks like and whatever... Mm-hmm. However you define that, um, you know, our, our society can put all kinds of labels on it that aren't biblical. And so we can get this idea that sex is dirty or sex, you know, doing that is dirty or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it can put a, um, a cloak of shame over it. Yeah. And um, I think what needs to happen if that's the case is the the husband needs to understand that that's where his wife's coming from mm-hmm. and talk about it. Yeah. You know, just 
you know, doing whatever it takes. If you need to get out the word of God and study the scripture together to see what the Bible says about certain things. And um, if you need to read marriage books from people that you know and trust that are coming from a biblical perspective, or even if you can talk to a, excuse me, trusted counselor or pastor um, to just get help understanding each other, because once you know what the issue is, there's got to be something that's causing the, the reluctance to want to um, yeah. enjoy sex to the level that God intends us to. And, um, you know, my husband has been very patient. He's a very patient man anyway, which is so, so helpful. So I would, I would encourage the men to ask God to help them grow in being patient and understanding mm-hmm with their wives to where they can talk about it. And the wife can really feel like she's being heard and not just manipulated for, you know, like the husband saying, I want to fix this so I can get what I want. Yeah. Now I want to fix this because I care about you. And I know that Mm -hmm. you're being tormented by something that God intends to be beautiful. And so let's work on this together because I love you and I want Mm -hmm. you to be free. So, um, you know, that's, I think that's the best best yeah. approach yeah. I, I also think a lot of it is the way our society is that I've said for, I think there is very a war on men taking place in our society today and if you turn on most sitcoms and things like that the message you are most often get men are just perverts and that's it yes yes that's so sad mm-hmm. because that's especially the young people that are watching those and they don't have an example of of a strong um, male role model in their life. So that's all they see. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think those people will be held accountable. Um, you know, the, 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 um, the message that they're sending out to so many, especially impressionable kids that are being monitored at home and are watching all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I, it makes me highly respect the godly men that I do know who love and cherish their wives. Um, it's not, it's, it's definitely going against the grain. And I also do tell guys, men are things such as, like, if you're thinking about those scenes that you see on a TV show or movie or, dare I, as much as I hate to say it, the pornography you've sometimes watched before, and you think that's what it's going to be like when you get married, you are in for a very rude awakening because that is not what it's like at all. Yes, and you wouldn't want it to be like that. Right. <laughs> right. So because it's then sex is just an it's just a an animal act. It's not it's not precious. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it really I mean that that part of the the fallacy and the danger in the pornography mm-hmm. is the fact that it always requires something new. It always requires something different. Yeah. It always requires, you know, um, and it's never satisfied. It's never satisfied. And mm-hmm. so that's not what marital love is about. That's not what the, the marital, healthy marital sexual relationship is about. And if pornography is part of that relationship, then that's not a healthy place and not a healthy place to be. Um, right. What would each of you say then to the person out there? Because sometimes it's actually the woman who's struggling as well. But what would you say to the person who is struggling with a problem with pornography? Um, I think the first key is exposing it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just as as difficult as that may be in the conversation to have that at the right time, to, if as a man you're hiding that from your wife or the wife's hiding that from her husband, um finding the appropriate time to confess that, to expose it, and then to do battle against that together. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that's, you know, Debbie has helped me a lot through the years and just being able to, to know that I can talk to her about anything. Yeah. Uh, now yes. For guys, I mean, I don't think temptation is different mm-hmm. um, than, than actually giving into it. If I don't, I don't, tell Debbie every time I'm tempted because that's that's an everyday thing. Yeah. I deal with the temptation. If I gave in to temptation, that's a different story. So yeah. I'm and the thing that's really helpful is to realize that you're not each other's enemy. And so it's not my job to police Tom. Yep. You know, to spy on him or see, you know, whatever he's doing, make sure he's toeing the line. That's not my job. 
we are on the same team fighting a common enemy who, like you said, wants nothing more than to, to destroy our sexual intimacy um, and to keep keep us at odds in regards to it. Um, I know I, as women, we can't relate to what men for the most part struggle with and, re, you know, regard to daily temptation. Mm. I was um, at a conference once I was with Tom, I was sitting right there with him and I had the most bizarre encounter. I'm, I'm sitting there listening to the man speak. And all of a sudden I saw him naked in the pulpit and I'm like, what? And I, and I just had to, in my mind, I had to just close my eyes. It's like, what is going on? Well, that entire day, everywhere, every man that got up to speak, that's what I saw. And I'm like, what is, I, you know, it was awful. I had to keep my, I couldn't look at the stage. I had to look down the whole time and, you know, taking notes, trying to listen, trying to fight, whatever this is. I've never experienced anything like that. Well, later I prayed about it. I said, God, what was that? And he said, that's, that's what your husband faces every day. Yep. The kind of temptation. And I never could have related to that until then. And then it's like, oh my God. And I looked at him, I said, that's, it's exhausting. And he said, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so my compassion for him increased and also my, my desire to want to do everything I can to make it easy for him to resist temptation. Yeah. And uh, so what I've told women before is that like, if you want to know what it's like in the mind of a man, picture that you're on a diet, you're trying to lose those last 10 pounds or so, but you have to go to the grocery store and you have to pass through whichever hour it is, the ice cream hour, the candy hour, the cookies hour, whichever hour it is. You have to go down that hour for some reason. That yes. is what it's like being in a man's world every time he's out there in the world and seeing women out there. And, and every aisle has somebody passing out free samples. Yes. yes. And... I say, lady, look at this way. Your husband is going to have a love affair with someone. Make sure it's you. Let, let you be the one that's fearing up his eyes constantly. Yes. Yes, and I see that as a way that I can help and serve my husband mm -hmm. because we're a team and we're together. So in the same way, you know, one of my weaknesses was that I would struggle with getting upset with our kids. I, my patience level was not nearly what his was. Mm -hmm. So he knew when I was reaching my limit and he would step in, you know, so he would help me in the same way. So it's just knowing your spouse and knowing where their limits are and just stepping in and being able to do, being willing to do whatever it takes to help them say yes to you and no to the sin. Uh, I know that what you're saying is definitely a great help because whenever I have to struggle with this and such, I mean, I'm one of those guys who's been lucky to, uh, or fortunate enough to not have to struggle with pornography and such. It was never a big deal to me and such. I didn't view it or anything like that, but I do still live in a war of temptation. But when things are going good with Allie and I and that area is being met, then it's so much easier when I'm out of a war because I can see someone and think, where, geez, I, I can't wait to get home and see my wife here because that's that's the feast I have in my eyes. And it it's, it's such a load off at that point. Yes. Well, I'm going to date myself here, but when I first I got saved in 1973, mm -hmm. I remember somebody coming to the apartment of some friends that I was hanging out with in, in about 1974, and a guy was passing out a pamphlet and saying that, you know, it's coming soon where you're going to see nudity on TV and it'll just be right there at the click of a button and we're going like, oh, no way, that'll never happen. Mm -hmm. That's before computers, before VCRs, before um, cable. Cable, cable networks, before, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Internet and all the stuff that comes on there, before iPhones and cell phones mm -hmm. and pictures. And, I mean, we've just been bombarded as mm -hmm. a culture now. Uh, and yeah. it's so much more readily available that we have to have that covenant that we've had in our heart before the Lord um, to guard our hearts. And he comes alongside us to give us the strength. That's what the grace of God is. It's giving us the power to say no to ungodliness. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're getting close to time when we're going to start wrapping things up. And what are some final messages you all would like to leave for husbands and wives about cherishing here? Um, I'd say, you know, it, it, I don't care how long you've been married. Um, 
it, it can get better. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just, the best relationship ever, it can get better. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all about pursuing the Lord together, but pursuing one another, studying your spouses, putting that marriage in the priority um, that it needs to be, um, continually pursuing. Uh, we've known couples that have been married over 60 years. Um, and even when you talk about the, the, the sexual part of it, we said, what's it like when you're in your 80s? And then that person responded, oh, we still pleasure one another. You know, so that gave, us, that gave us hope, you yeah. know, <laughs> that, um, you know, marriage is for a lifetime. Now, sometimes that lifetime is a lot shorter than than others, but we, we, we want to do it all well. Mm-hmm. And we want to do it for the glory of God. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the key. I think everything that we do, we're doing it for an audience of one. And we want to we want to be an accurate reflection as much as we can. Of course, we're going to fail. We've got you know we're still growing, changing, learning. But as as much as in our ability at this moment to glorify God in all that we say and do and how we love our spouse, mm-hmm. um, and in anywhere that we're not to be open to the Lord's correction and for His help to change. Mm-hmm. And you all have been married for 39 years, I believe you said. And I think you all would agree there. Even after all these years, it's still worth it every single day, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I do have to say, I do go to your Facebook page. Some Something I've done every day except Sunday for quite a while now because I don't yeah. post on Facebook on Sundays so I'll go and I'll share a marriage meme from somewhere such as your website mm-hmm. and then I'll post a message of love to my spouse every day on Facebook and make it a public thing because I want everyone to know yes I'm crazy about my wife yes yep. that's excellent Excellent. Mm-hmm. well we don't really have enough time to get into any other question here so let's go ahead and start wrapping things up here. The book is Cherishing Us, 365 Tips for a Healthy Marriage in a Romantic Vineyard. As of this time of recording, the paperback is nine ninety seven. The Kindle version is three ninety seven. Now, I know you all have talked about it before already, but do you have a blog, a website, an email, a way people can get in touch if they want to find out more? Yes. Our, our, the address for our blog is The Romantic Vineyard. Dot com. Mm-hmm. You have to put the the in there, otherwise you'll go to a bed and breakfast in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're in Australia and you want a little bit of romance, that could be something to do, but it won't That's work fine. here. It won't work here. So it's theromanticvineyard.com. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also very active on Facebook, um, and that's under The Romantic Vineyard. And we have an Instagram account under the same name and Twitter, The Romantic Vine. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave today for the Deeper Waters audience? I would just encourage you, wherever you are in your relationship right now, to plan a date night Mm -hmm. and to go out and do a state of your union and just have a good talk Mm -hmm. um, about all the intimacies in your relationship, your spiritual intimacy, your emotional, your intellectual, where you stimulate each other with um, new information Mm -hmm. and your sexual intimacy and Uh, My husband has heard it from somewhere. I don't know where, but um, intimacy is into me see. So Mm -hmm. when we have those conversations, we're inviting our spouse to see into us on a deeper level than anyone else will. Mm -hmm. So I just encourage you wherever you are to take that time and it will not be wasted. Mm -hmm. You will you'll see a payoff, especially if it becomes a consistent Mm -hmm. practice. Anything you want to add to that, Tom? Um, No, just. um... I heard it said one time that a successful marriage requires falling in love many times, always with the same person. Yep. So, mm-hmm. well, that's I, it. I'd like to thank you all for giving your time to come on here and talk about this today, and hopefully, we'll see you back here again sometime. Thank okay, you very thank much. Thank you, Nick. God bless you. I'd like to remind everyone that next week we are going to have, yes, the person who I will easily say from now on will be my favorite guest ever. My wife is going to be my guest next week talking about Asperger's as well for Autism Awareness Month. We're gonna, I'm sure we're going to have some interesting stories and such being shared. And who knows, maybe she'll get to share some of those embarrassing stories about me as well. 
For now, I'm Nick Peters, and I'm signing off.